So what have we learned today? We have learned that for the beauty of life to exist, for the millions of variations that happen, so that the millions of species can exist and adapt to their environments and give us some healthy competition, for the differences in all of us and every single living creature, we need to evolve. And evolution has taught us that even though we're all so different, so beautiful, we are all essentially the same. All of life, every single thing that's alive today can claim the same share of heritage having descended from the same microorganism in a relationship that can be traced back to 3.8 billion years. Evolution is just a simple fact that the distribution of genes changes over time. And it was Charles Darwin who first tried to explain the theory of evolution evolution. And note that I'm using the word fact. How do we know that evolution exists? My answer to that is fossils. When I use the word fossils, you immediately think of being chased by a 15 foot dinosaur. All skeleton, all scary. But you know what? The fossil of a bone doesn't have any bone in it. A fossilized object has the same shape as the original object, but it's chemically more like a rock. Another immediate thought is the movie Jurassic Park. Though Jurassic Park to some extent tells you somewhat a bit about some of our ancestors, the dinosaurs, the big picture of fossils is just too big to fit into one movie. Note that I'm bravely calling dinosaurs our ancestors. You must be thinking I'm crazy, right? But I have scientific evidence to show you that we all have a common lineage. Although that's way, way, way back in time. And how do I know? There are fossil records of many organisms that show that although organisms at that point were different from the organisms now, they are still very, very similar. If I show you a snail and ask you uh, if this were to become a fossil, which part would fossilize? Would the whole snail form a fossil? The fact is that in most cases, the harder parts form fast fossils. So if you talk about creatures with hard attachments to their bodies like turtles, tortoises, snails, and most of the sea creatures, the part of the body that would be preserved would be the shell. Softer parts cannot actually survive this long. Now, to usually classify something as a fossil, it should be at least uh, around 10,000 years old. Okay, If it's less than 10,000 years old, it's called a sub-fossil. More than 10,000 years? Yes, it's called a fossil. So how do I manufacture a fossil? Mind you, this is not a quick uh, experiment, which you can just do. Yeah, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take ages and ages, over 10,000 years. So let's get into the fossil story. Let's see how fossils are made. Uh, some animals were quickly buried after their death by seeing in the mud or being buried in a sandstorm. So over time, more and more sediments will cover the remains. So the part of the animals that didn't rot, usually the harder parts like the bones and the teeth, were encased in the newly formed sediment. And in the right circumstances, that is when there is no scavengers and not much weathering, parts of the animal will turn into a fossil over time. So the deeper you dig, the older the fossil. Okay, that's the logic. After a long time, the chemicals in the buried animal bodies will undergo a series of changes. As the bone slowly decays, water infused with minerals will seep through the bone and replace the chemicals in the bone with rock-like minerals. The process of fossilization involves one, dissolving and replacing the original minerals in the object with other minerals, and sometimes it also includes something called pre-mineralization. That is the filling up of spaces in fossils with minerals. And sometimes it can also include recrystallization in which a mineral changes its original form. In the end, what do we get? We get a heavy rock-like copy of the original object, a fossil. The fossil has the same shape as the original object, but it's chemically more like a rock. Fossils are not just imprints of bones and other hard coverings. You also have other fancy uh, things which we have preserved through fancy processes. Some organisms are embedded in amber. Amber is a hardened form of tea sap and this usually preserves insects or pieces of plants as is. Okay? And fossils of imprints can form like casts of dinosaurs' footprints. These impressions in the right circumstances fill up with sediments that fossilize. And what's the largest dinosaur fossil that we have discovered till now? The biggest dinosaur fossil is Sauropsidon which is believed to have stood 60 feet 
tall and may have weighed as much as 60 tons. Thus, uh, as tall as a six-floor building and as heavy as nine elephants. Now, Megalodon, the biggest shark, is estimated to have been around 40 to 50 feet long and weighed around 48 tons. Tiniest dinosaur fossil was found in China. Microraptor, 12 inches long. Now, the smallest fossils of all are the one-celled organisms that are also the oldest, the blue-green algae. And these fossils tell us stories wonderful, beautiful stories as to how we all are related and how we all descended from the same single prokaryotic ancestor, the grandparent of us all. does this bat and this dog. Inside, we all have the same internal structure. One longish bone at the top, leading to two thin bones at the joint, followed by a small cluster of bones and then the fingers or the digits. All four of us choose our forelimbs for totally different purposes. The whale swims, the bat flies, a dog runs and I, well, I use it for a million things like eat, drink, write, you know, play tennis, draw, wave hands at you like this when I'm teaching and so on. Now, our limbs have the same structure because we descended from the same animal. Say like a tektalik, which other than having a really cool name, seems to have been perched midway between a tetrapod like, you know, lobe finned fish and the later true tetrapods. The earliest ones being the acanthostega. And in our first stage of existence, every vertebrate looked exactly the same. Why? Because we have all descended from the same initial vertebrates. Because I told you about homologous structures, which I'm sure you understood by now, uh, structures that have nothing but the same origin, I can't leave this discussion without discussing its alter ego, analogous structures. And to understand it, let's look at the wings of a bat and a bird. They both use wings for flying, but if you zoom into their wings, what do you see? You see that the wings of the bat uh, you know, have skin folds stretched mainly between elongated fingers. But the wings of a bird are feathery, covering all along the arm. Now, the designs of the two wings, their structure and components are therefore very different. They look similar because they have a common use for flying, but their origins are not common. This makes them analogous characteristics rather than homologous characteristics. So part one of my proof that we have evolved from the same set of organisms is fossils. And part two is that we are made up of the exact same molecules, DNA and RNA. Every single living thing on our planet uses DNA and or, you know, RNA to store the blueprint of life, which gives instructions to cells and make every living thing what they are. So this very fact that we use the same molecules to write down our code of life suggests that we are essentially related, although very, very distantly. And DNA sequencing can show us how alike we are. And you must have guessed this, our closest living relatives, the chimps, have a 98.6% similarity in the genome, followed by cats with a similarity of 90%, cows at 80%, mice at 80%. And I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but chickens and flies at 60%, which means that we are 60% similar, you know, to a fruit fly. Now, just as your DNA proves that you have descended from your parents, it also proves that you have descended from different organisms and ultimately from that one prokaryotic organism. And so it would not be wrong to say that the whole world is one big family.